A mysterious organism prowls the waters of North Carolina. Victims find their skin burning. Then, they begin to fear they are losing their minds. Even the scientists studying the organism succumb. Health officials rush to close rivers and beaches. They must track down the mysterious source of this dangerous sickness before it's too late. Carolina coastline, a watery wilderness teeming with life. Fisherman Seth Willis and David Jones had worked North Carolina's Noose and Pamlico rivers all their lives. But not too long ago, they began to notice something strange. At certain times of the year, when they were on the water, David Jones felt nauseous and lightheaded. Buddy, I'm gonna have to let you handle it. I don't feel like nothing. I feel bad, real bad. Mm. It always passed, and mostly they didn't worry about it. I'll be all right, man. One day in 1995, though, it didn't pass. In fact, it got worse. When the men turned to head home, they ran into a problem. Neither one could remember which way was home. It was a clear day, and they knew the Noose River like the backs of their hands. But on this day, nothing looked familiar. They were disoriented, confused. They motored in circles for hours, trying to fix on a familiar landmark, as David Jones recalls. Out of the clear blue, you don't recognize the landmark. You don't recognize where you're at. It's a weird feeling. I was lost within myself. After hours of riding around aimlessly, they finally came upon their boat ramp. But their thoughts and actions just got more and more jumbled. We were trying to put the boat on the trailer. Very, very simple operation. Just like putting your pants on in, uh, uh, when you get up. That's it, that's it. No, no daggone. The only problem is, can't focus to get it on the trailer. Almost three and a half hours. That, that, that's it. Baby should have been with me. When he got home, David Jones described the incident to his wife. We got sick. We got lost. And it's gotta be the room. Margaret Jones had been seeing a lot of changes in her husband. I got real scared and I worried and I would ask him, don't you think you need to see a doctor? I'm not gonna see a doctor. Just throwing my money away. The more he stayed out on the water, the worse he got. Is your lesions and rash getting worse and worse and worse? As David and his partner, Seth Willis, compared symptoms, they found they both had begun to develop lesions, sores on their arms that didn't heal properly. The lesions started appearing at the top of the glove where it touched the skin. This one, seven months, finally healed. The lesions began not healing, but more appearing. Just going out in the water is gonna make you come back. There's a little something going on, but you can't quite put your finger on it. The men noticed the lesions flared up whenever they were working on the water. 
Oh, oh, look at that. Oh, man. Check this out. Yeah. Look at that. Not only that, the fish they were handling also had lesions. Look at you. Same way. Man. Same way. Finally, David's symptoms got so bad, he decided to make the trip to the doctor. Could you tell me what happened precisely? When he could not even get out what his thoughts were, I didn't know if he was having a nervous breakdown. I just didn't know because he just was not acting rational. And he kept saying, you know, I feel like my skin's crawling. He said, I feel like there's something that's crawling around in my skin. And uh, I never, I mean, I couldn't understand. I said, well, maybe, you know, you've got an allergy or you're itching or something, you know, because sometimes you feel like your skin's itching. He said, no, it feels like something is in my skin crawling around. Out there the the doctor night. couldn't find any medical explanation for David's symptoms. He suggested that he contact a scientist in Raleigh who was conducting a study on fishermen with similar mental and physical problems. Her name was Joanne Burkholder. As the director of the Center for Applied Aquatic Ecology at North Carolina State University, Joanne Burkholder is a marine ecologist who had been hearing about a mysterious illness that was plaguing fishermen like David Jones. I was on the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission, and so I interacted with a lot of fishermen in our state, especially coastal folk, and I began to just quietly ask them, have you ever had any problems when you've been out on the water? Do you ever get sick? Has ever any funny things happened? The doctor traveled to New Bern and met with David and Margaret Jones. Very severe. Matter of fact, uh... By the time that I met David Jones, he had burning eyes, burning skin, couldn't breathe. He wasn't talking very well. Um, he had serious bouts of memory problems. She knew Jones needed help. Burkholder suggested he see a doctor at the Duke University Medical Center's Neurological Disorders Clinic. Dr. Donald Schmeckel specializes in hard-to-treat neurological cases. His presenting symptoms basically make you think of the nervous system. He was having difficulty reading, he was having some difficulties in emotions and, and thinking. He also had some indication of widespread body type of changes. His liver functions jumped a bit. He had a skin rash. So uh, the sky's the limit there. Do you have a systemic medical illness that's affecting the nervous system indirectly, or is the nervous system the issue? When you have a skin rash, you have to argue that, that not only the nervous system, but the rest of his body was also being affected uh, by, the, by the exposures. All right, we're going to have this lay back here. Watch your neck. The first step was for David Jones to have a CAT scan. The results were not good. The scans showed David had suffered serious neurological damage. He had an injury deep within the left temporal lobe of his brain, the area linked to memory and language. But the doctor had no idea what was causing it. He was telling me my body was degenerating daily and there was nothing they could do to stop it. Whatever was attacking David Jones's body wasn't only affecting fishermen. Joanne Burkholder had gotten sick herself. In the course of working with fish from these North Carolina rivers, she had come down with symptoms just like Jones's. There were problems that crept up on us, but I did write them off. Sore throat, it must just be a virus, or headaches, it must be stress. Shortness of breath, asthma-like symptoms, must be allergy. And it wasn't the first time. A couple of years earlier, Burkholder had been studying similar water samples with diseased fish when she had a strange reaction. I had been putting my hands into aquaria to get beakers of water to put into different containers for this experiment. 
and I would hold the beaker close to my face. She began to feel faint and disoriented. She needed to get out of the lab. I doubled over, I had uh, severe stomach cramping and realized I wasn't breathing very well and had asthma-like attack. <sighs> Outside, the fresh air seemed to relieve the symptoms. But Burkholder wasn't going back into that lab. She went home instead. And I don't remember much else for about eight days, except that I would have periods in which I could, I could realize something was really wrong. It was really a very frightening experience. She called in sick with the flu, but her symptoms suggested something quite different. For a week, her memory seemed to fade in and out of focus. I realized that I couldn't hold a conversation, so I hid, and I stayed in my apartment for about eight days. And as I began to come out of it, I tested myself by watching a news Cast, and then seeing if I could write down a simple sentence that someone had said. After more than a week at home, Burkholder felt well enough to get back to work in the lab. Now she was determined to try to find out what made her so sick. She had been studying a class of single-celled organisms called dinoflagellates, or dinos. They're primitive so-called. That is, they have been on Earth for a long, long time. They're considered among the oldest of the types of organisms with nuclei in their cells. So they've probably been around for literally 500 or 800 million years. However, they're not really very primitive in some respects. They have had a lot of time to evolve complex chemical interactions with other animals. On the day she became so ill, she had just started working with one specific organism a tiny predator known as Fisteria. As this one-celled killer morphs through as many as 24 life stages, it becomes more and more deadly. In fact, it had recently been linked to massive fish kills along the Carolina waterways. Exactly why, no one knew. But Fisteria seemed to thrive where the rivers meet the sea, in coastal estuaries where salt and fresh water mix. The signs of its presence in the tidal basins of the Neuse and Pamlico rivers were alarming. Fisteria is a generalist. It eats just about everything and anything. Um, it eats dead material, live material, but its favorite source of food is fish. Like a microscopic Jekyll and Hyde, most of the time, Fisteria was a benign little organism, lying dormant in the silt at the bottom of estuaries. But in the presence of fish, something would trigger it to grow many times its size, sprouting tentacles and potentially releasing a venomous toxin that paralyzes its prey. The Fisteria's toxin was so powerful, it could literally peel the flesh from the fish's bodies. In short, Fisteria was transformed into the perfect killing machine. Scientists feared that this newly discovered organism might also be attacking humans. They had to find out, and soon. In the coastal waters of North Carolina, a strange organism was possibly attacking fish, killing them and eating away their flesh within minutes. Humans who worked the waterways were also developing large skin lesions, loss of motor skills, and memory problems. Same thing. Jones? It was an illness that was plaguing many fishermen, like David Jones. I'm sick, I'm not feeling well, and I can't get the most important question answered. What is happening? No one can answer this question. 
At the North Carolina Center for Applied Aquatic Ecology, Dr. Joanne Burkholder's research team searched for answers. It seemed to her that Visteria might be more dangerous than anyone knew. It might be targeting humans. Watermen were the most common victims, but Burkholder's staff was also suffering. Howard Glasgow is a marine ecologist who had worked closely with Joanne Burkholder on Fisteria for years. He also experienced some strange symptoms while researching the organism. I just, you know, got this really euphoric feeling. Uh, you know, stood up and it was like my mind was rushing a thousand miles an hour, but my body was moving like moonwalking, really slow, uh, and it's kind of the out-of-body experience, if you will. I head on my way home. I was at that time living about a half an hour away. It, it took me about three hours to get home. Evidently, I was wandering aimlessly around. Hi, everyone. Um, With a dozen lab workers sick, the university had no choice. Unfortunately, going to have to share with you. They closed the lab until it could be made safe, stopping all work with Fisteria for over a year. All of our cultures were destroyed um, because they just couldn't survive a year and a half of dormancy, so we couldn't get them back up and functioning. We basically had to start all over. In June 1995, a biohazard level three laboratory was opened. It was divided into two sides, a vented contained so-called hot side for working with toxic agents and a separate cold side for everyday offices. Once Burkholder was satisfied that the design of the new facility would greatly minimize the risks of exposure to lethal organisms, the research into Fisteria resumed. Samples were regrown Airborne Fisteria was never known to affect humans, and Burkholder set out to answer two key questions. Exactly how did it affect humans, and what could be done to stop it? She called on the National Ocean Service in Charleston, South Carolina for help. John Ramsdell and Peter Moeller are two of the leading experts on marine toxicology in the world. Burkholder sent the lab a sample of Fisteria, and the men went to work trying to isolate what made it so dangerous. Peter Moeller knew what he was being asked to do was nearly impossible. It's like looking for a needle in the haystack, but we don't know what the needle looks like. We have to start partitioning this haystack, throwing out all the stuff we recognize as hay, and testing everything else. And then we have to slowly build up what we determine to be the active constituent. We don't know what it looks like. Is this mysterious grown with fish or without fish? No, this is the stuff grown with algae or without fish. The scientist's first challenge was trying to identify and isolate the toxin from the fisteria itself. Toxin samples were dissolved in a solvent and then isolated using a controlled evaporation process. Same toxin without fish. That's right. Oh, that's wonderful. So Once they isolated it, they next sought to learn how it worked. In the lab, they studied how specialized cells reacted to the presence of the toxin. Look what I found, I did a quick scan. It's for the Fisteria fraction gen just received. Where is the activity? It's fraction six, seven, eight. We probed the inside the cells to look at the type of biochemical mechanisms that are occurring. And it's from this information that physicians can better understand how this toxin causes the adverse effects, say, on memory processing, say, on formation of lesions on the skin. About 22 and a half minutes after that of the toxic fraction. What they found 
was a dangerous substance that acted in frightening ways. Ramsdell and Moeller used their research to gain insight into the possibility of the Fisteria toxin adversely affecting immune system and brain functions. That fish isn't moving at all. Now that they were beginning to understand what the Fisteria toxin did, these researchers wanted to see just how aggressive it was. What different kinds of cells would it attack? In researching fish kills, they tested how it responded to different types of blood. It didn't seem interested in frozen chicken blood. But when they gave it human blood, what they found was startling. It is incredibly aggressive uh, and loves to attack. And indeed, after providing it with the human blood, we saw that it uh, aggressively ate the, ate the human blood just as aggressively as it did the, the fish blood. The Fisteria moved from cell to cell like vampires, breaking down and devouring the blood cells. They were ravenous, and their favorite food seemed to come from humans. Scientists were in a race to find something to stop them. In 1995, North Carolina researchers were working to find the source of a mysterious illness. They had been examining an aggressive microorganism and a potentially dangerous toxin that was linked to the slaughtering of fish populations. Now they feared this organism was also targeting humans. At a North Carolina aquatics lab, a new facility had just been built to safely contain dangerous organisms. The Fisteria toxin was confined in a biohazard level three containment area. Marine ecologist Howard Glasgow's work area was in the safe zone, yet he was still showing mysterious symptoms. I would have conversations with people and walking out of the room and coming back in and not having even remembered having the conversation or being there and argue with them about not having been there and tell them that they were crazy when actually it was me that was actually having the problem. The lab technicians feared that somehow the toxin might have become airborne and was leaking out of the containment area into the offices. If that was the case, they needed to find the source of the problem fast. They feared something might be wrong with the ventilation system and conducted a smoke test. Smoke was introduced into the vent system to see how the air from the work area was being processed. All the smoke should have been vented to the outside. But when they went to check Glasgow's office, their worst fears were confirmed. An improperly installed ventilation system was sending air from the toxic hot room directly to the vent above Glasgow's desk. So naturally, he sustained a lot of exposure and thought he'd been working in perfectly safe conditions. Thank you for getting Howard's case led to theories from the researchers that Fisteria did not just strike through the water. Its toxin could possibly cause illness even when airborne. That was something fisherman David Jones already knew. No longer working on the water, he still grappled with his mysterious symptoms. I can be less than 800 yards from the water, and my skin will sometimes itch. My eyes start watering. A headache comes on. You know something is present because it is affecting your senses. 
Burkholder's team turned their attention to the Noose River, where David Jones and other fishermen were getting sick. They now thought that if the Fisteria was concentrated in the water, it could easily become airborne and endanger people across the state. As the wind picks up, that can cause the, the water molecules to get into the air, and the water molecules would have attached to them potentially Fisteria toxin. Back at the lab, water samples were prepared for examination. The water was in fact teeming with Fisteria. If the Fisteria toxin became airborne, researchers feared it could infect thousands of people living, working, and playing along the waterways of North Carolina. The implications were chilling. And that was just the start. In fact, the researchers thought they were facing a much larger problem, since Fisteria was not just confined to North Carolina. Two hundred miles north in the Chesapeake Bay, the watermen of Maryland were witnessing something terrible. The water was covered with fish, thousands of dead fish, with sores and ugly lesions, and tails that had been eaten away. And the Maryland watermen were also getting sick. Dave Morley had been fishing the Chesapeake region for years. In the last year, he'd begun developing chronic memory lapses, along with red, festering sores on his arms. His strange symptoms sent him to the office of his family physician. Hey, Doc. Good afternoon. Dr. Richie Shoemaker of Pocomoke, Maryland, noticed a lot of watermen coming into his office with lesions covering their arms and legs. And you've been sick for they were also complaining that they were losing their minds. Uh, memory loss is a big, a big thing. These illnesses don't follow the pattern of anything that we have seen before. Pretty early on, it was clear that as a family practitioner, I didn't have background in any of the many different sciences that were coming to bear. And I didn't know what was going on. So my fear was that I would not be able to help. Shoemaker became very concerned. He began doing his own research and found that North Carolina was experiencing the same problems with fish and watermen linked to an organism called Fisteria. One name kept popping up, Joanne Burkholder. Yeah, my name is Rich Shoemaker. I'm a family practice physician in Pocomoke, Maryland. Contacting Burkholder, he found striking similarities between his patients and the fishermen she had documented. Like human illness, we've got some very unusual skin lesions. They're not like anything that I've seen before. A sample of water from Maryland was sent down to the North Carolina Aquatics Lab. Technicians there identified Fisteria microbes present in the water from the Chesapeake Bay. The results confirmed Dr. Shoemaker's worst fears. The dangerous toxin was also infesting Maryland's waters. In 1995, a newly discovered microbe had surfaced along the coast of North Carolina. It had been linked to the killing of millions of fish and was now thought to be preying on the men who worked the waters. In Maryland, hundreds of miles away, the same organism had been detected. But the discovery had not yet been made public. Little did anyone know that one influential fisherman on a weekend excursion would break the story wide open. Think you're gonna catch anything today? 
Maryland Governor Paris Glendening was out fishing with his son. Oh, look at that, look at that. Lady. They caught a rockfish just north of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Oh yeah, that's a big one. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's but their excitement soon turned to horror as they discovered it was covered with lesions. I was gonna tell you, they were gross. I mean, it was almost like a, a um, either acid or a worm or something had bored, in some cases, all the way through uh, the fish. The health of the fish was not good at all. And it was clear, we, you know, we have serious problems. And the problem just kept getting bigger. Weeks later, 10,000 fish were found floating dead at the mouth of the Pocomoke River in Maryland. Dr. Richie Shoemaker's small practice was becoming overwhelmed with patients. All of them had eerily similar complaints. Skin lesions, confusion, memory loss, headaches, fatigue, burning eyes and throats. Fisteria was the first illness that we found to be acquired from environmental exposure to a compound made by a living creature, a biologically produced neurotoxin. These illnesses don't follow the pattern of anything that we have seen before. In Maryland, like North Carolina, fishermen weren't the only ones affected. Yvonne Lawson was a researcher who was documenting the fish kills. We're gonna do a little eye test of visual contrast. After working with the fish for several months, she began suffering memory loss and more. Respiratory problems. I had no concentration whatsoever. I couldn't read, couldn't carry on a conversation. Right. If I don't write it down, it won't get done. That's why I write notes and why I live with a pocket full of notes. Take another look at number six right here. In Shoemaker's small practice, he identified 60 patients with what he believed was severe exposure to fisteria. Officials now knew they were dealing with a full-blown epidemic. Eager to document the effects of fisteria, they decided to push the case up to the state level. A panel of doctors headed by Dr. Glenn Morris from the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Johns Hopkins traveled to Pocomoke to examine firsthand a group of patients identified by the public health department, including the patients of Dr. Shoemaker. We all kind of piled into a health department, beat up health department van to go down to the, to the Pocomoke River. And uh, on the way down, I delivered a short uh, lecture on hysterical reactions and, um, you know, talked about the fact that, that our goal was to try to provide reassurance from a public health standpoint that there wasn't anything going on. Um, as it turned out, it didn't exactly work out that way. What the physicians saw startled them. Marley, good morning. Hey, Doc. These patients could not be classified as having hysterical reactions. In fact, all 13 patients they examined had skin lesions, some memory loss, and learning difficulties associated with exposure to fisteria infested water. Why don't you come right this way, Mr. Moreland? We're going to be in exam room three this afternoon. Okay. Dr. Lynn Gratton, a neuropsychologist from the University of Maryland, was asked to measure cognitive functions of the patients. We have Mr. Morley with us today. Um, the watermen that we had a chance to meet with were frightened. Uh, they were anxious. They were worrying about how this was going to impact their ability to work, to make a living, um, whether or not it was reversible, whether or not they'd get better. Take these pegs, which are shaped like little keys with a round side and a flat side. And place them using your right she initially thought it would take about 15 minutes per patient for the evaluations. As I'd instructed you. Okay. Right hand only. Are you ready? Ready. Right. Okay, go. I did not expect to find significant or dramatic health problems when we went out there. It just seemed uh, incomprehensible to me that. Uh, that there could be a toxin suddenly appearing in estuary waterways that, that could suddenly start making people ill. 
In the end, the impairments they were displaying were so profound, she spent nearly two hours with each patient. I was in a, a state of considerable disbelief. To have something so clear and striking and consistent amongst an entire group of people was pretty remarkable. The people who had been exposed um, to the waterways to a significant degree um, were suffering from significant problems in, in new learning and memory. After 10 days of testing, the panel met to discuss their initial findings. You got 13 people and just about everybody has some kind of skin problem. There were some on the feet, some on the hands, and some on the trunk. So. Interesting. Their stories were quite amazing. Confusion and memory problems. So I'm really curious what, what Lynn was able to measure because, you know, from an internal... The panel compared the Pocomo cases to a sampling of average watermen. Okay, let me start out by just passing out a... Uh, brief preliminary Dr. Summary. Gratton documented the waterman's symptoms. Her research showed that people exposed to affected waters had a whole range of cognitive difficulties. Our findings essentially demonstrated that the uh, impairment was in this compartment of memory, the element of memory that is involved in new learning. They were able to learn material at a much slower rate than age and education uh, compared. Uh, normals or non-exposed individuals. Um, the deficit was pretty significant um, and this probably explains why they're complaining of confusion. They're not taking in. This was not at a hysterical reaction. This was something very real and there was something very real and very strange that was going on in, in, in the brains of these individuals. Oh, these, are the, these are the PET scans. Right. The medical team prepared their report for the Maryland State Health Department. They didn't mince words. As you can see here, there's some hypermetabolic activity outlined in the bright yellow in this group compared to the control group. Now, They finally had strong indicators that exposure to the river caused problems with learning and memory. What they didn't know was how they could combat it. What we have here is, is still a mystery. Uh, we don't know what's going on with these people, but the data that we have say that there's something real that's happening. One of the things I'm not comfortable with is I'm not... All they knew was that the problems originated on the waterways. Like to. Um, we're gonna have people out there on that river, and are we comfortable with people having continued exposure to the river based on what we're seeing with these findings? We need to get the state health department into this and, um, and, put in, and go to the governor. You know, the governor is ready to close the river if you give him the red light and tell him to. Yes. Under those circumstances, from a public health standpoint, we got to shut down the river. The governor had only one choice, and he acted swiftly. For the first time in Maryland history, he ordered the Pocomoke River closed. No one knew exactly when it would open again, or if they would ever be able to help the people who were falling ill. After a deadly microbe invaded Maryland waterways and people began getting sick, in 1997, the governor moved quickly to close the Pocomoke River. He wasn't taking any chances. It moved it from being a local fish kill problem uh, to a problem that potentially threatened uh, human life, human health. At the National Institute of Environment Health Sciences in North Carolina, leading scientists also gathered to compare research on the toxin. Lots of state officials from Maryland convened there along with fishermen and some of the local physicians and certain scientists who were invited up to try to shed light on the issue. And all of us got together and presented data or uh, ideas and hashed, uh, hashed over what we thought might be going on that was causing the fish disease. The key question for scientists, what had happened to trigger the illnesses? Normally, fisteria occur naturally in waterways and aren't a problem. But something had allowed the microbes to grow rapidly and out of control. 
The scientists at the summit theorized that the increased pisteria levels were a direct result of increased nutrients in the water. Much of it potentially caused by animal waste products washing into the rivers and upsetting the natural balance. The waste runoff in North Carolina rivers was so extreme that it could be seen from space. The amount of manure produced by swine in North Carolina is, is the equivalent, it's considered, of all the sewage from the people of California and New York in combination. North Carolina officials decided to close the infected Noose River. Meanwhile, the Maryland State Legislature took the strongest action of any state, passing the Clean Water Act of 1998 in direct response to the Visteria infestation of the Chesapeake waterways. Miners used to take canaries into the mine, and if there was uh, bad gas there, the canary uh, would die, uh, and the miners give, give them time to escape that mine before the gas killed everyone. I think the Fisteria is like the canaries of years past. It is a clear signal that we have exceeded pollution levels beyond what is reasonable, beyond what nature can tolerate uh, in our water. And it is an implication to us that we've got to do something about this. Mr. Benton's ready. How's he doing? His memory's not very good today. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. While lawmakers grappled with how best to handle the situation, doctors like Richie Shoemaker were still dealing with dozens of patients who were suffering. What's going on? Yeah. Really got to touch all the What do you mean? As he began seeing more and more patients, Dr. Shoemaker played a hunch. He decided to try cholestyramine a powerful anti-cholesterol drug that works by attaching itself to harmful cholesterol and carrying it out of the patient's system. Cholestyramine has been used for many toxicologic problems in the past. It's one of the few things that binds dioxins. It binds chlorothalonils. It binds DDT, for goodness sake, PCBs. It binds toxins. How long has this been going on? Dr. Shoemaker's guess was right. The drug proved so successful that the first three Fisteria patients who received it were symptom-free in three days. Shoemaker found that the drug had to be administered shortly after the Fisteria exposure began to be effective. It worked best for limited exposures. Three months after she first saw her original 13 patients, neuropsychologist Dr. Lynn Gratton conducted a follow-up exam to check their cognitive function. Okay, now can you tell me as many words as you can from that set? Yeah. Eleven had recovered to near normal levels. Two, who possibly had the highest degree of fisteria exposure, remained severely impaired. You seem to be doing very well. How are you feeling? A lot better. Mm -hmm. Much better. Today, the Fisteria outbreak has emerged as a highly public health issue. As this vicious microbe intensifies its assault at the National Ocean Service Lab in Charleston, South Carolina, Dr. John Ramsdell continues his work to find a way to control the Fisteria. His team is trying to create a marker so that health officials can identify Fisteria toxin in the water. In the lab, the eerie green glow of a Fisteria sample means success. Dr. Ramsdell and Dr. Moeller have combined a gene from a firefly and that of a human to create a marker gene that glows green in the presence of Fisteria toxin. When these cells respond to the toxin, they turn on the firefly luciferase gene, making all the enzyme that gives them the capacity to make light. So hence, these cells become almost like little flashlights in response to the toxin. Instead of going through a biochemical change that leads to cell toxicity, they go through a biochemical change that generates light.
but for researcher Howard Glasgow at the North Carolina Aquatics Lab, all of the research may come too late. His condition continues to deteriorate. He has developed shakes, a numbing in his arms and legs, and a progressive degeneration of his spinal cord. If uncorrected and we're unable to control this, then eventually it will get to the point where I'll be completely paralyzed because of the area in which my demyelinating or nerve degeneration problem is occurring on my spinal cord. Certainly I have a, a personal investment uh, uh, associated with understanding the mode of action of the Feasteria toxin. We need to know more about how it affects the brain, how it can be useful in understanding Alzheimer's-like symptoms, neurodegenerative diseases such as multiple sclerosis, all of which, you know, in combination with one another have, have presented in my situation and others that have been exposed to Feasteria. This is about a, an Alexandrium toxin that I'm checking into. Thanks. Dr. Joanne Burkholder herself has also suffered significant exposure to Fisteria. She still battles with chronic bronchitis, yet she continues her work with the toxin. The only reason that I stayed working on Fisteria was because of Howard's health only reason that I stayed after the 1997 outbreaks in Maryland, stayed in North Carolina, was to, to see through to the end, getting this toxin characterized, to see if there was anything that could be done to help out. Scientists have yet to develop a test to detect the Fisteria toxin in human blood. For now, medical scientists are calling the health effect estuary-associated syndrome. So open your mouth a little bit for me, about like that, good. The testing continues Excellent. while there is still debate on whether Fisteria is truly the cause of these symptoms. The signs and symptoms are so nonspecific that they may uh, be mimicked by other very common illnesses. We will not know the answer until effective tests for the toxin are developed. And I think the prudent thing to do in the meantime is don't eat fish with lesions and don't be around fish kills. Have a line down here for me, please. For physicians like Richie Shoemaker, the obvious symptoms can't be overlooked. Take any one person's word for a claim, it has to, has to stand up. Other people need to see it, and skepticism is right. But skepticism in the face of obvious abnormalities is inappropriate. Look at the condition of them, the coloration. They're supposed to be white and clean, and they are brown and full of toxins. Those who suffer symptoms from possible fisteria exposure, like fisherman Seth Willis and David Jones, don't need experts to tell them the effects of fisteria are real. As David Jones' health is degenerated, he can no longer work on the water. The toxin has taken away the only life he has ever known. I spent a lifetime to build a business, and it was taken away from me. You feel like you are a burden on someone else, and it's not a very pleasant feeling. As scientists grapple with understanding this mysterious organism, David Jones only longs for the day when he has a clear mind and clear water in which to fish.